thanks very much and uh yeah thanks very much for uh having me on the uh the, the chapter meet up today uh really it was always great fun going to different OWASP chapters and uh you know speaking at different OWASP chapters sometimes virtually sometimes in person um especially topics when I'm passionate about them and this is certainly something that I'm particularly passionate about and uh yeah, hopefully it'll be a, a useful update and useful insight for people into the OWASP uh, application security verification standard project and sort of where we are with that and what we're seeing at the moment. So before I dive into that, uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Josh Grossman. Uh, my day job, I work as an application security consultant for a company here in Israel called Bounce Security, sort of a boutique uh, application security consultancy. Uh, working with lots of different uh, clients locally, overseas, seeing lots of different environments, lots of different application security challenges. And I also deliver talks and training um, around the world on that topic as well. Uh, in my spare time, I uh, also very involved with OWASP. I am uh, on a local chapter board here for um, OWASP Israel. And I've also been involved in various other projects. I had a very small amount of involvement in Juice Shop project a while ago as well, um, which was good fun. But uh, yeah, the main reason I'm here today is because I'm a co-leader of the application security verification standard. Uh, and yeah, I put some pictures up there as well for what I do in my actual spare time. So, so that's me. Um, so what do I want to talk about today? So I want to give a brief background to the SBS and talk a little bit about what it is, how it fits into the overall context of, context of OWASP, and yeah, you know, just sort of understanding, okay, what are we talking about here? I'm not going to go into too much detail. I will provide some other resources for it, but I do want to give an update on sort of where we are at the moment and what our plans are for the next upcoming version that we're trying to, to work towards. And I also want to talk a little bit about sort of how we're seeing ASPS used in industry and sort of some of the initiatives we're seeing, because I think it is, it is useful to sort of understand where we are with that and also how you can be involved and how you can help out um, with this overall direction as well. So the eternal question, what is the ASPS? Um, certainly the first question a lot of people ask when they come into this sort of presentation. Um, so I like to talk about the ASVS and I like to say, well, first, what isn't the ASVS? What, what's the ASVS not? So we're here at an OWASP meetup. I presume everyone's heard of the OWASP top 10 risks. Uh, even when I'm not at OWASP events, people have usually heard of the top 10 risks. So the top 10 risks is this great project. It's released every few years. Um, got really sort of high profile, very experienced leaders who bring together 10 issues in application security. Certainly the most recent versions, 2017, 2021, had a lot of input from the wider community and uh, public comments. And it's very, very frequently cited. It comes up in all sorts of different contexts where they want to talk about application security. And it's effectively a very, very good application security awareness document. And that's the key thing here, because the OWASP Top 10 Risks is an awareness document. This isn't controversial. This is something that the project leaders are very clear about. It's a document for raising awareness about application security. It's about saying, look, there are these problems in application security. There are these things that we need to think about. There are these things we need to address. But it's not a standard. It's not designed to be a standard. It's not designed to be assessed against. You know, organizations like PCI have historically said you've got to comply with the OWASP Top 10, which is not at all what the OWASP Top 10 is for. Um, you know, it's effectively 10 things. And sometimes, sometimes those things are one thing. Sometimes those things are lots of things. And it's not everything. Again, it's just a top 10. It's just a selection of them. And one of the things that I find a little bit challenging about it as well is it's bringing a bunch of problems. It's saying, look, here are a bunch of problems you need to think about. Here are a bunch of problems you need to solve somehow. Um, especially when I'm working with developers, I find that uh, it's not an ideal way of helping sort of build secure software by saying, look, here are a bunch of problems. Now, now what are you going to do? So there's another project, which is lesser known, but still really great. Um, called the OWASP Top 10 Proactive Controls. So this is a, a guidance document for sort of building secure software. And this time it's focused on developers and builders. And it's basically giving a list of 10 sort of good practices to take into account and to apply when you're building a piece of software. You know, what do you want to, um, to do? What do you want to do right when you're building a piece of software? Or what security controls should you have in place? So this is a great starting point. Um, it's also got a really great team of you know, experienced leaders who prepared the document, got a fair amount of public feedback as well, and you know, came up with this, this document of practical guidance. Here's what you should do for security when you're building an application. Problems are that 
it's still not 100% comprehensive. It's still not all encompassing. It's still not okay. Here is everything you think about. Again, it's more of a starting point. It's more the sort of document where I say to developers who are just starting out, sort of thinking about security here, you know, look, look through this because this will give you sort of a vague overview of some key security thoughts and some key security topics and things to think about. But it's, it's, you know, it's, it's an, it's a starting point. And, you know, again, it's more, more for awareness. And again, it's not organized like a standard. It's not something you can comply with. It's not something you can say, okay, well, yes, we now comply with the proactive controls. It's, it's a nice document, but it's not comprehensive and it's not a standard. So that brings us to the, uh, the eternal question of, uh, what you're going to do. Um, what are we going to do? We want to help developers build software securely. You know, certainly in my day job, that's the aim of the game. I want to work with development teams. I want to work with development organizations. I want to find ways that they can build software securely within their organizations and find ways that they can assess, okay, how are we doing from a software security perspective? So what's the answer? Um, unsurprisingly, uh, as we're here, the answer, I think, is the OWASP ASVS, the Application Security Verification Standard Project. So, what is the ASVS? So the ASVS is a set of requirements for a secure application. So the idea is we give a list of requirements saying, look, these are the things that you need to take into account. These are the considerations you need to take into account when you're building a piece of software, when you're building an application. And we very specifically structure it to be like a standard. It's something you can work through line by line and think, okay, am I doing this correctly? Am I doing that correctly? Am I complying with this? We try and make it leading practices, which means that you know when we released version four in 2019, we knew it would be a few years until we were able to release the next version. So we wanted to make sure that the controls and the requirements and the considerations that we include in the standard are going to be useful for today, but also for tomorrow, for next month, for next year, and you know, already, already looking at things that will be useful going forward. So for example, when we talk about cookie attributes in the standard, there's a particular requirement in the standard that talks about a cookie attribute that was well, quite early stage, not really known about, just a, a property of cookies that if you named them in a particular way, it would make the cookie more secure. Tell the browser to treat the cookie more securely. Now, when we wrote version four back in 2019, this was sort of an early stage draft, but we could see the other browser vendors, the browser vendors had, had adopted it and they were using it. And it was just sort of going through the formalization process. And we could see, look, this is something that is, going to, is useful now. It'll be useful in the future. It may be early stage, but it's still going to be useful. So we put it in. We had that, that there as something that has now sort of gone through more of those, a more formalized process, but ultimately it's supported by the browsers and it gives a nice level of security. So we wanted to include it. So it's a good example of making sure that we're thinking about you know, what's relevant today, what's relevant in the future. So since sort of the early stages of preparing version four, the standard has been developed in the open in GitHub. So everyone can see what's going on. Everyone can be involved in discussions. Everyone can provide their suggestions. And you know, that's very, very important from our perspective. You know, I'm lucky to share with a very sort of well-experienced and uh, knowledgeable set of co-leaders. Each of whom has their own strengths. Each of whom, each of whom has their own depth of experience. But we want to get a wider level of experience as well. We want to get wider input as well. We want to get input from the wider community, and that, having it in GitHub allows us to do that. It means that we can get feedback from all sorts of different corners, all sorts of different um, people in different uh, organisations. And that's what happens. We've got a lot of a lot of open issues there. A lot of things to uh, think about in the context of the standard, and that's great. It means it's more applicable for the wider industry. Now, the ASVS is quite large. Um, the ASVS version four has about 280 requirements, and that's that's a lot to do. That's obviously a lot to think about. It's not really something we can eat all in one go. It's not really something you can take in one bite. So we have a level system whereby we try and introduce teams, organizations in slightly more gradually to make it easier to start off using the ASVS. So version four has three levels. We've got the standard level, which, sorry, we've got the minimum level, which is level one, which is sort of the basic level of security we'd like organizations to get to um, as a starting point. It's not really enough for sensitive data and sensitive operations, but it's certainly a good starting point. It's certainly where we see as, you know, the, the most important things to start with. Um, so that's level one, the minimum level. There are about, still about 130 requirements in there, but hopefully a lot of them are already being done. 
And most importantly, and sort of usefully for the verification side, all of those level require, level one requirements should be testable using sort of the standard sort of application penetration testing approach. Um, whether they are all checked for, that's a different question. We'll talk more about that later on. But in principle, they should be testable from the outside. Level two is what we call the standard level. This is where we say, look, this is where applications should strive to get to. This is where we want to try and uh, aim ourselves. Now, these requirements tend to be a little bit more in-depth and a little bit more difficult to achieve. You might need to ask, you know, if you're an external tester or an external assessor, you might need to start asking the developers questions. You might need to start looking at the application architecture. Uh, you might need to start reviewing some code just to, uh, you know, understand exactly what is going on behind the scenes and whether they're really complying with that, what you're supposed to be complying with. But it's certainly, you know, th that's the level we think that most applications should be striving to get to. It's still about another 130 requirements, but they're already a little bit more involved, but they're also bringing a lot more value in terms of the security protections they provide. And finally, there's level three. Level three is the sort of the advanced level, the uh, maximum security level. And we say, well, if you've got an application that's particularly sensitive, it's storing very sensitive data, it's performing very high value transactions, um, that's where you might want to start thinking about level three. And level three brings in about another 20 or so controls, 20 or so requirements, but they tend to be a little bit more involved, a little bit more complicated. Um, and again, designed for sort of the highest levels of assurance. So for version four, that's how we try to make it a little bit easier to go in. It's still quite a large learning curve, but you know, that's obviously a, a tricky balance when we're trying to build something that is comprehensive and is going to lead to a decent level of security. So, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk much more about the latest version. The latest version is 4.0.3. Um, I've got talks online where I've spoken about those in more detail. I think that it can be useful to go through that information and you know, understand a little bit more in depth as to you know, how 4.0.3 is made up and the sort of requirements that are in there and you know, a little bit more about some of the, the, uh, the details about how it looks. But uh, yeah, you can scan that code if you want to see a previous talk or go to that URL if you want to see a previous talk. And I'll go into a lot more detail about 403. But today I want to talk a little bit more about how we're seeing the ASPS used and sort of also have our, our vision for, for the use of ASPS. So when we talk about the ASPS, the idea is to be relatively widely applicable and be sort of usable from a number of different use cases. And again, because I sort of bias towards working with developers and helping them build securely, um, I often end up talking about the first few bullets here. You know, how we can use the ASPS to develop secure requirements at the requirement stage of development. How can we can use it maybe during a design review as a checklist to say, look, have we got this included in the design? Are we taking this into account in the design? Uh, maybe use guidelines whilst you're implementing. Okay, well, which algorithm should we use for this? Which mechanism should we use for this? Where can we refer to to, to discover this? Um, or even just saying, look, we want to put this security mechanism in place. We want to put this additional security control. Um, I don't know, maybe it's an appliance. Maybe it's a security uh, software package or something. Maybe it's a security service we're using in the cloud, our cloud environment. Okay, so which of the ASPS requirements is it helping us to address? Just to understand, okay, what value is it bringing us? But one of the key uses, which is kind of hinted at by the name, is use as a verification standard. You know, the application security verification standard, that's, <laughs> it's in the name. And I think it's something that maybe it's not used as much as it should be at the moment. And we're looking to see how we can address that. So I'm not talking about this, this sort of verification. Um, but rather, you know, verifying the security of an application. We've got an application. We want to figure out, okay, what is the level of security within this application? How well is it covering common security requirements, protecting against common attacks? So what do we usually do? Uh, we usually do penetration testing. Now, back in 2011, this is, you know, 12 years ago, um, almost. There was this uh, presentation at uh, 44Con, 
that uh, someone reminded me of actually just this week in, in a different context. Um, and they pointed out to me that someone else, uh, Rory McCoon, also did a very similar presentation, I think, earlier in that same year. In 2011, people were saying, look, penetration testing has got problems. It doesn't work great. Um, it's not an, I- an ideal solution. But that's what everyone's doing. That's what everyone has continued to do. You know, when it comes to security verification of applications, that seems to be one of the primary um, controls that people use, one of the primary activities that people uh, put into place. Now, one of the key problems of penetration testing is that, as Harun said, it, it's a market for lemons. Um, what does that mean? It means that if you are a someone who buys penetration tests. You're an organization that needs to receive penetration testing services. If you look at a company and think, well, how good are they? How not good are they? You don't have any way of knowing. You don't really have any way of knowing how good is this company at doing penetration testing? How good is the actual tester going to be? You know, the company themselves know how good they are in the same way that, you know, a used car salesman who's trying to sell a car that they know is under the hood, it's been really battered and it's not been looked after. They know that, but the person who's looking at it from the outside can't tell that. That's where the, you know, the market for lemons concept comes in the first place. The idea that the seller knows whether it's good or not, but the buyer has no idea and no way of finding out. And overall, this leads to, because the buyer can't assess, okay, well, how good is this test? How well are they going to do this test for me? How sophisticated are they? It just leads to this trend of, well, if buyers can't tell the difference anyway, and sellers just start selling bad services by default and they start undercutting and they start reducing prices and reducing quality. And this is what I see. I see you know, multiple people in the industry come to me saying, look, why, why are penetration testing reports so bad? Why, why is the quality so bad? I mean, I, I, I literally looked at one this week. Someone sent me one as part of a training course that I was working on. Um, I was delivering them a training course and I asked them to send me some sample findings. And there's a grammar mistake in the title of the finding. I was like, so there's a grammar mistake in the title of the finding. What does the rest of the finding look like? Um, and this is the trend we're seeing. And this is the direction we're seeing where the overall quality of secure, you know, app secure verification, penetration testing is just diving through the floor. And that's being widely acknowledged in you know, lots of different forums. And it was being acknowledged as a problem, as an issue in 2011. So we can do better. We can do better penetration testing. We can get better at this. And I actually gave a talk on this 2018, it must have been now, AppSet USA and um, a couple of other locations as well, saying, look, we can do better better application security penetration testing. Um, you as a buyer can demand more, ask for more, be more pushy, get more value out of the process. Um, but what, what I came up against when I was trying to actually take this into account in, in industry was that the industry overall was still sort of making this downward spiral towards lower quality. People didn't want to pay extra to get higher value because, well, this person will do it for like two thirds of the price or half the price. So why don't I just go with them? So one of the ways they tried to solve this for sort of regular network penetration testing was by creating the penetration testing execution standard back a long time ago. This is something that was suggested for 2011. Um, this is more of a, a network penetration testing guide. And the you know, real concept was the same. Have a fixed methodology for doing this, have a standardized way of doing this that all testers should be using, an approach that all testers should be using, and a way that you can enforce some consistency, some comparability, and you know, a better quality of end product. So if that's for network security, what can we do about application security? What could help us provide a standard for verifying application security? Um, unsurprisingly, the, the OWASP ASPS. And we think this is in a, in, a, in a great position to do this. This is a great um, standard that can be used to actually say, okay, well, this is what we're assessing against. This is what we're verifying the application against. You know, something like the Web Security Testing Guide, another OWASP project, which is you know, a great sort of how-to for how to perform security testing. And that's great for the sort of the how-to aspect. But the nice thing about the ASPS is it sort of gives this you know, requirement-led um, methodology, this requirement-led set of um, tasks, set of things to look for that the developers can be working from and the tester can be working from as well. So we want to get the application security verification standard used more in this sort of context. Um, but we have some sort of challenges there uh, from an OWASP perspective. So first of all, how can OWASP remain neutral? Um, OWASP is a 
not supposed to be super opinionated about you know, how you should do things or who, which organizations you could, should use. Um, so OSP needs to sort of remain as neutral. We, we're going to say, look, this is what we see as secure. This is the guidance that we see as being good guidance for security, but how you apply that and the context we need to sort of have a little bit of distance from. We also need to think how to drive adoption of the standard. You know, where can we build demand for this? How can we make sure that organizations are seeing the value of this and are actively asking for it? Um, and then how do we know that the tester is competent to do this sort of thing? You know, this is a little bit removed from regular application penetration testing. Suddenly doing a test verifying using the application security verification standards, there's a lot more going on. It's a lot more complicated there. Um, and the tester needs to have a slightly wider view than just, here, I'm going to break this web app. So I want to talk about a couple of initiatives that we've seen. Um, it's important to be clear. I'm providing these initiatives to as an update. I'm giving them as information. We're not advocating these initiatives. We're not saying, go do this. We're not saying, you know, we're, you know, again, we, OWASP and the ISVS team remain neutral, but we do think it's important that the industry is aware of what is going on and what sort of initiatives there are out there. So the first initiative I wanted to highlight is the CREST OVS program, the OWASP verification standard. Um, and the idea is to take ASVS and also MASVS and layer on top of that a standard for actually performing the assessments. And that's sort of an area where the OWASP and the ASVS team don't really want to get into. Hey, how do you perform a test? How do you, you know, report on that? We sort of, it's not really what we're doing. We're trying to provide the security guidance, but CREST are then stepping in and say, look, we want to build this program around that for how you should perform that assessment. And the intention is that this sort of test should go over and above what a penetration test would, would normally do, but also result in some sort of standardized and comparable reporting format and then can be put, compared across different applications or across different organizations aside, you know, instead of sort of a haphazard reporting that comes from penetration testing process. Um, Crest have committed to um, donating revenue back to OWASP as sort of a thanks for using the standard, which I think is a, a, a nice move from their perspective. Um, so it was announced last summer and they're, they're working on it. You can see more information at this link. And yeah, from OWASP's perspective, it's quite useful because we get this sort of arm's length thing where we can say, look, we've defined what the ASVS is, you know, the MASVS team have defined what the MASVS is, and then Crest will handle the way the the overall program in the way they want to do it. And they consult with us, but it's not our not our thing. We remain at arm's length from it. And that's you know, that's where we want to be. We want to be in the position to define the standard and say, look, this is the security requirements we think are important, this is the way we think you should be doing it. You know, this is the security requirements we think that an organization and application should have in place. Don't let Crest worry about the overall program itself and how to do the assessments and how to um, handle everything else. So Crest have a lot of experience in driving adoption and actually getting us adopted in the industry. So you know, that, I think that's a, a good boost for awareness and adoption of the SPS. They also have experience in accrediting testers. It's something that they do day to day. So this is sort of a nice initiative that we're seeing that's basing on the ASVS. This is Crest initiative currently, but taking the ASVS and say, okay, well, let's take this to industry. Let's actually use this in industry. The other initiative I wanted to call out is the App Defense Alliance, which is another initiative, which uh, through Google sort of oversees quite a large ecosystem of applications. There are other organizations involved as well. And the idea is that all applications within the ecosystem will go through some sort of assessment that is in some way based on ASVS and MASVS. Um, and they've got various different ways of sort of slicing and dicing that depending on the impact of the application. Um, because they also have a scalability problem. They want to be able to cover a large swathe of different applications. So that's the, uh, the URL if you want to see more information. They've got a few programs. They've got a mobile program. They've got a sort of cloud program, which is more about sort of classic web applications. Um, and in this case, again, we're defining the SPS. The App Defense Alliance defines how they're going to use it. Now, that means that industry has to look at the, uh, that, uh, the, the App Defense Alliance and the way they're using it, make sure they, they feel comfortable with that, make sure it, it makes sense. Um, but again, if organizations, members of industry who are involved in large ecosystems of applications can, can drive this adoption, then it's you know, an important step in saying, look, we want to have a more consistent way of verifying 
security of applications in the industry. If they say, look, in order to ride this ride, in order to be part of this ecosystem, you need to comply with these requirements, and that's going to lift the overall position of the, of the uh, ecosystem. It's going to increase the overall security level of all applications, because as soon as you want to start working in this ecosystem, as soon as you want to start using Google's APIs or being in the Play Store, you're going to have to comply with these requirements. So it's certainly a, a, big, a big benefit for adoption of the standard as well. The tester question is a little bit more of an open question. Google's got their own views and you know, in terms of how that's going to work within the App Defense Alliance. But again, it's a very interesting initiative that's saying, look, we're going to take the ASVS and we're going to take the MASVS, and we're going to do something with this. So that's useful from an OWASP perspective for pushing the ASVS forward. Google have also provided a donation to the ASVS project, which is uh, certainly very, very good of them as well and important for support. We'll talk about that more afterwards as well. So what other challenges do we have? What else do we need to think about from the ASVS perspective? So the other key challenges that we've identified at the moment are the usability, um, the scope, and the scalability. And here's what we want to do. So for usability, we've got version 5 coming up. And usability, we want to be one of the key sort of goals of version 5 of ASVS. We want the standard to be even more usable than it is today, even easier to start working with, even easier to understand. Uh, in terms of the scope of the standard, that's a, there's a lot of open discussion about that at the moment. You know, historically, it was a lot easier to say what an application is. Nowadays, that's a little bit more complicated because now we have CI/CD systems and we have vulnerabilities in those CI/CD systems and we have um, software supply chain issues and we have sort of cloud infrastructure that's sort of on the border. So there are a lot of discussions and issues going on about what exactly is the scope of ASPS. We are trying to keep it to focus on the application elements and leave room for other um, groups, for other projects within OWASP to sort of look at the other areas as well. So there's already a supply chain verification um, uh, standard that looks at the more you know, the, the software providence and you know, how it's being brought into the application. So there's already a verification standard about that. And maybe we see other ones as well. We want to focus on our core area. But certainly if you've got opinions, come into the GitHub issues, open GitHub issues, ask questions, and let us know what you think. Scalability is also a challenge. I think by making it more usable, then scalability will get easier. And it'll be easier to start using this for multiple applications. There's a wider question there about automation and in general, how do we apply this across a, a large ecosystem that we're still thinking about? And it may be that once we come to version 5, we can look at what areas are easier to automate compared to others. So overall for version 5, we've got a few key principles. Um, we've already started working on this. If you look into the GitHub repository today, you'll see that there is the stable branch, which is the uh, 403 branch, and there's also the uh, 4.0 directory in the GitHub repository. And then we've also got our main branch, our master branch, which is within the 5.0 folder there. We're actively working on modifying what's already there, making changes, and trying to strive towards these goals and also get through our, our issue backlog. So the key goals, looking at the existing requirements and trying to, to clarify them, make sure that they make sense, that they're understandable, a lot of them have carried over from a few SVS versions, and maybe the world has changed slightly. Maybe our understanding of how things work has, has changed slightly. So we're actively seeing ways of clarifying that and making it clearer. There's also the fact that we want to make it more accessible for, for developers. We want to make it easier for someone who's not got a, you know, not a full-time security specialist, not deeply embedded in that world. We would like to make it easier for them to look at the requirements and say, all right, this is, this is what we need to do here. This is the uh, mechanism we need to put into place here. So that's, uh, a key goal. And obviously we're also adding a bunch of requirements as well. Um, we've got lots of different people who are opening issues saying, what about this type of issue? What about that type of issue? And each time we've got to think, is that covered by an existing requirement? Do we need a new requirement for that? Or is it maybe just an existing requirement needs to be clarified to cover that? And that's uh, certainly leading some some interesting discussions in the GitHub issues, especially around questions such as, you know, what do we sanitize for? What do we input validate for? What sort of um, attacks are all going to be covered by a similar requirement that we can just put in as one requirement. So we don't have to have one line for every new requirement. So 
Next thing is about the levels. You know, I gave an explanation of levels one, two, and three beforehand. We'd like to make it even clearer. We'd like to make it even easier, sort of, and maybe even reduce the barrier to entry. And there's needs to be a difficult discussion there about balancing between um, mandating that application is secure, but also making achievable goals. Which, you know, and the reason why there's 130 requirements just in the minimum levels is because we feel like we can't go less than that. We can't allow organizations to miss this out and still say they're complying with the level of their SBS as a version 4. In version 5, we need to have another think about that and think about where do we need to make lower the barrier to entry, have some sort of easier level just to provide that sort of easier stepping stone to get into the overall process. Um, there are a whole lot of mappings and document. We want to try and clean that up. We may move some mappings off the face of the main document to try and make the document a little bit clearer, maybe streamline the main document as well. I think there's some useful information there, but there's also there's a lot of text. And I think that a lot of organizations aren't necessarily looking at the supporting text. They're looking at the requirements themselves. And I think maybe we need to look through that and clarify a little bit about you know, what's really the important text here? What do we want to keep and what can we move to an appendi you know, appendices or what can we move out of the way to so we're not clouding the view of the overall standard? So that's the overall sort of goal and vision for version five, and that's really what we're working towards. And that's really you know the theme of issues that we're looking to see and looking to address at the moment in the uh, in the GitHub repository as we work towards that. So I've got a few calls for action here. Um, ways you can help, ways you can be um, prepare for this. Look, based on the initiatives we're seeing at the moment, I think we can expect that testing around ASPS and MASPS is likely to become a lot more commonplace, a lot more, um, we're going to see this a lot more in terms of how organizations are performing assessments, how organizations are requesting assessments, how regulators are expecting that assessments will be performed. And I think we need to be going into this sort of direction. You know, the whole point of having these documents there is to provide you something you can use to say, well, how are we doing from a security perspective? And can someone external verify that? So if you're an application penetration tester, can you start using the ASPS for your testing? I've already spoken to you know, various penetration testing organizations that are doing this and are looking at you know, using this as a basis for their work and using this as the basis for their methodology because they can see that it gives them that sort of clear language they can use to articulate what they're doing and also provide guidance to developers. And from an application developer perspective, if you're working in an application development team or you're working in a security team that's securing an, an application, can you structure your control documentation and the way that you talk about security around the ASPS as well? You know, if you can use this as the guidance for your developers to say, look, this is how you need to build this in. This is how you need to um, implement your security controls. And when they come to assessment, it's going to be a lot easier to comply with the assessment because you've already documented it in that way. You've already documented it using that structure. So I'd certainly say it's important to start moving towards that now. Um, like I said, I've got a great team of co-leaders, very experienced. Um, yeah, without these folks, this just wouldn't happen. Um, but it also wouldn't happen without a large group of contributors in the, in the, uh, GitHub repository and asking questions in the Slack channel as well. And you can be there as well. We, you can help with that as well. You can provide your comments. You can provide your guidance. You can provide your ideas. So yeah, go to the GitHub repository. Um, submit issues. If you can't find them through the search, a lot of time issues have been brought up already. So search to see whether it was already discussed. Um, submit your general feedback, comment on other people's issues. Don't know to open new issues. You know, give your opinion on other people's issues. Someone, sometimes someone will open an issue and I'm thinking, well, I think this, and maybe another leader thinks that, but what does everyone else think? What does the rest of the industry think? And there are certainly um, in issues in the GitHub repository that are marked as community wanted, community needed. So if you've got time to look at those issues and give your opinions, and help us sort of decide, you know, which direction we're going to go with these uh, with these questions. Um, there's some URLs you can use to access that, and also see our, our contribution guide as well. So the final call to action is tough. It's a difficult subject, but you know, I think more and more we're seeing this model in industry. We're seeing this model where a huge amount of reliance and a huge amount of work is being is relying on a very small amount of people or a small amount of um, available effort. You know, right now, we've got a lot of work to do for maintaining the standard, for addressing issues in the, in the repository and trying to push towards version 5. And you know, each issue that gets opened, we're talking about half an hour, hour, several hours of investigation, thinking about, well, how are we going to address that? What's the best way? Looking back through the history, thinking about how we get consensus, 
there's a lot of work that goes into it and we're definitely looking to try and push this forward and accelerate it but at the same time this is you know a group of volunteers doing this in our spare time so we're lucky to have a few supporters um we've got various employers who act as maintaining supporters because they allow us to do some of this on employer time um so thank you to clarified security to bounce security and to manicode um who are the employees of some of the leaders who again we get to spend some of our time at the employer working on this project which effectively means this employer you know employers are funding the project to a certain extent um, like I said, we also had a great contribution from Google and also from one consult, Apero and, and Crest gave consult, um, gave contributions as well. Um, but certainly we're looking to other organizations who can support the standard and help us push it forward. If we could get a group of organizations to put a little bit more together so that we can really accelerate and jumpstart version five, I think it'd be a really fantastic move for the industry and give us a really strong standard to base on. So in summary, um, Get ready for verification, expect assessments to go this way, start expecting assessments to be this way, start trying to make sure that, okay, if you're assessing or you're using, assessing using a particular standard, if you're building a control environment for an application, are you building it according to that standard? Um, and then, yeah, help with version 5.0, be that in GitHub issues and providing inputs, or be that working, if, you know, if your employer can provide financial support through our OWASP, that's going to be a big benefit for the project and also you know, certainly um, prestigious for your employer as well. So if you're a large organization that wants to fund us, that would be fantastic because I think this is a, a great way of pushing the overall security level of the industry forward. So if you want to carry on, continue the discussion, um, this is a go to the GitHub repository. Um, you can also reach out to me on Twitter. That's a good way of getting hold of me. If you've got uh, specific questions, I'll put the rest of my contact details up at the end. Um, and then just one more thing, uh, Tim Cook style, sorry, Steve Jobs style. Um, <laughs> if any of you feel like some May sunshine, um, we've got the AppSec Israel conference coming up in a few weeks time in Tel Aviv. So tell your friends, tell your employers, and it'd be great to see anyone out here. It's going to be a great event. Um, tickets are on sale now. Sponsorship is available. And yeah, we're hoping for a really great event in a few years post, um, since COVID, so uh, yeah, this is our, our first proper year back. So uh, yeah, if you can make it, it'd be great to see you. Um, but for now, that has been me. Uh, you can get contact contact with me. You can get in contact with the ASVS project overall. Um, if you've got any questions, I think if you put them into the chat, I think they might be able to read to read them out. But uh, otherwise, feel free to reach out. And yeah, thank you very much for your time. And yeah, please be involved and be in contact. All right, uh, Josh, thank you for this presentation on the application security verification standard. Meanwhile, in the chat, one of the qu one question has already appeared. Uh, Valentine Scholten asks, are there any software tools that facilitate performing a verification session on a pro project or application to re regard the results, not to verify the actual requirements? Is that, as you say, an automated tool for performing an assessment? Uh, to facilitate performing, so to record the results. To record the results. Um, so I think I think maybe Daniel Cuthbert and the Santander team had a, a sort of application you can use to sort of you know, stand up this application and say, okay, well, we're complying with this requirement, we're not complying with that requirement, just a sort of a, a reporting mechanism. So I think um, Daniel Cuthbert and the Santander team has something along those lines. Um, I don't remember that. I don't remember exactly off the top of my head. Um, I don't know whether SKF allows to demonstrate it, to record in that format as well. But uh, certainly, I know that the, the Santander had something. I think. I wonder if I can find it. Okay. Regarding the security knowledge framework, I heard you mention the SKF. Um, indeed, it helps you uh, shift through uh, requirements to list only those that are applicable to your application. Of course, that provides a more comprehensive list of uh, results and uh, for that a more comprehensive list to process. Um, other things uh, that might come in handy, but not necessarily to record whatever has been verified as being well well done, uh, is of course our Defect Dojo project and uh, similars are also available. I've seen a next question from Nariman Aga Tagiev. 
and I hope I pronounced the name right, uh, for a team that is looking into um, improving their security de software development lifecycle, um, would you advise to start with ASVS or threat modeling or both activities in parallel? Um, <laughs> so where would I advise to start? I think to a certain extent it depends on the, the on the, on the, the the team and the context. I think it's a, it's a much wider question. Um, I think that you can I, one of the one of the key things from my perspective is to try and make all these activities sustainable. I think if you're working in it as a security person and you're an application security person, you can't be doing this yourself all the time. So the first thing is, well, how is this going to happen once I stop doing this? How can I move this responsibility onto developers and make it something they can do. So I think it's a question of how easily do you think you can make one, um, get, take one of these activities and adapt it in a way that developers can pick up and use it on an ongoing basis. And there'll be, you'll need to get buy-in from development management in order to do that. But I need to get the developer time to do that. Then you start thinking, well, if I want to start with ASPS, maybe I can um, provide some sort of a uh, way of filtering the view of the ASPS to focus on sort of specific topics or specific areas. Um, so they think, okay, well, if I've got a, a new feature that I'm building that covers this area, then I can use this tool to get a particular view of ASPS or a particular subset of ASPS. And then I know the requirements I need to take into account when I'm building that feature. So that's one option. Another option is thinking about, well, how can I take threat modeling and make it more accessible? How can I come up with some sort of lightweight method or some sort of um, staggered method where less risky features have a much more sort of high level quick view and more risky features have a more in-depth view. But in each case, I think it's a question of figuring out what's going to work, work best with the team, what the team are best going to be able to adopt within themselves, and then you know, how you can adapt the, pro the process to facilitate that. Um, I don't necessarily I don't think I'd advise one over the other. Um, but I guess from my perspective, it may be that ASPS can sort of help you earlier on because ASPS can help you at the requirement stage or out while you're already thinking about, well, how's the, the feature going to work? And whilst you're thinking about how's the feature going to work, maybe you're thinking about the security, um, security concerns as well. So that might be an advantage of having ASPS first or having some sort of secure requirements process based around ASPS. Right. Thank you for this uh, for this answer. And I see a similar uh, line within the chat now. Ellie Rose uh, says, uh, ASVS is requirement stage before any actual work on a feature has begun. You can build some requirements into acceptance uh, criteria in the stories. And of course, that's a good idea um, earlier on. Uh, makes it easier to adapt. Threat modeling is design stage when you have... To, uh, a diagram slash flow and can brainstorm threats and risks during that. But again, before any implementation. Well, Ali, thank you for your uh, additions to this uh, answer. If there are any more uh, questions, uh, please voice them now. Um, Josh will not be uh, available after the presentation from Bjorn, but we might be able to uh, relay questions by email. And of course, you have his contact details from the previous slides. So if you have any further questions, uh, well, free, feel free to use them. Yeah, actually do feel free to get in touch. I'm um, sorry I can't stay much longer, but uh, yeah, do get in touch and ask questions. We always like to get more input and uh, hear, more, hear more perspectives. Yeah, exactly. Okay, um, Josh, in that case, I would uh, like to thank you for your uh, contribution uh, for today. 